very clean. Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Speakers and Leaders Hour. I'm Dave Wilkins, your host, and this is the program that comes into your home once a month, first Tuesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Now, I know we're competing with Wheel of Fortune and the other really great show, Jeopardy, but we still would like to think that you'll tune in to us this evening and find out what's going on in the communication and leadership world, also known as Toastmasters and also Robert's Rules of Order of Parliamentary Procedure. Our members here are a combination of multiple organizations, uh, both the Bob, the Bob Lyman chapter of Toastmasters, the Anthony Wayne Toastmasters, the Red Cross Toastmasters, the Field Toastmasters, and Advanced Speakers and Leaders Toastmasters, and then also the uh, Bob Lyman chapter number 32 of the American uh, Institute of Parliamentarians. And we're here to promote these two fine organizations that help you improve your life with communication sp skills as well as leadership skills. And we had a talk last week before we really began our speeches and presentations, and we talked about impromptu speaking. And tonight, I think that we should talk about, for just a few minutes, how we put our speeches together and perhaps where we get our ideas. <coughs> And I could start off, but I'm wondering, would you like, oh, let me introduce the panel. I haven't done that yet. On my far left, your right, will be Marlene Purdy. Marlene, give a little wave to the camera there. And next to her is Bob Norris, both members of the Bob Lyman Toastmaster Club and also the Parliamentary Society and Toastmasters. <clears throat> On the other side of the room, we have Tom Haller. There you go, Tom. And next to Tom, we have Patricia Canabi. And these people represent the leadership of Toastmasters and also the leadership of the Parliamentary Club. And so let me ask the question again, and I think that we'll start with, um, I'll say, Tom Haller, on how do you prepare speeches, maybe where do you get ideas, and how do you go about putting them together? Well, I appreciate that question, <coughs> Mr. Wilkins. The fact of the matter is that I read quite a lot. I read uh, Forbes, I read National Review, I read the Wall Street Journal. I also listen to certain uh, mostly Fox News channel programs, and I get a lot of ideas there. I get a lot of ideas from my life, a lot that I've spoken about. A lot of, excuse me, a lot of the speeches I've done are from my own life experience, both recent and past. I grew up on a small farm, went to a very small school. We did a lot of unusual things by today's standards, and I consider a lot of what they're doing today to be strange, so it all kind of averages out. But it's a combination of life's experience and keeping abreast of what is going on. That makes uh, really good sense, Tom, and I belong to the club where we hear so many of your speeches, and they are. They're really awesome and so informative, whether you're talking about the dragoons and the world wars in the past or steam engines in the early part of the last century or any topic you want to discuss is always interesting. Patricia, I know you have a couple favorite topics that you speak on a lot. and Could you share some of that with us? I would love to share those with you, Dave. Thank you very much. My favorite topic to speak about is my two dogs, Moose and Fred. I have written so many speeches about those two goobers in my life, it's not even funny. I, I have a friend at the Red Cross Club who says that I can make a speech out of nothing, much like Seinfeld's TV shows were episodes about nothing, but they were elaborate escapades, and many times my speeches turn into very large, larger-than-life stories about my dogs. When I do need to get serious about a subject, I go to my teaching experience and look at the information I have from my teaching experience and use that to craft speeches that are a little bit more intense or a little bit more knowledge-based. Very good. Thank you very much. 
And Marlene is a longtime Toastmaster. Marlene, do you have a special method for putting speeches together or special topics you like to talk about? Well, I always, I like to share how I put them together. And that is different than a lot of people would think. A lot of people think you start writing a speech at the beginning and you go from there. I believe in starting in the middle and you write the body of the speech and only then do you put an opening and a close with it. But two of my fun topics that I've done, and I don't consider myself funny at all, and so once in a while I have to come up with a humorous speech. And believe it or not, some of the humorous speeches that I've used are direct, directly in line with experiences. My favorite was Squirrel 3, Human 1, my battle with the squirrel and the bird feeder. Another one, I'm a, I'm a pack rat, and I've done one on confessions of a pack rat, which ended up being quite humorous also. So those are some of the fun things that I've enjoyed putting together for Toastmasters. You, you do a lot of very funny speeches, I think. And the pack, it, that, it might be the pack rat speech that you used in a contest. And this was my first contact with you mm. some years ago. And it was with uh, hats and all the hats that you collected over mm. yay many years. Well, it wasn't just hats. Believe it or not, I actually had the dress that I wore in the county spelling bee back in 1955. Oh my goodness. Huh? I can't get into it of course anymore. Well, <laughs> and uh, it is the most horrible looking dress you can imagine but I can't part with it. Did, did you make it? No I bought it. Oh, I see. It was olive green and beige and mm. tan and it had little triangles in it and it, I mean it's really ugly. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, thank you for that bit of information, Marlene. I appreciate that. And uh, Bob, you've been around Toastmasters a few years now. Do you have some particular method that you use when you write speeches or some way of putting them together that you really uh, ruminate on or use? Well, sometimes it's a matter of illumination. Sometimes it's a matter of perspiration and inspiration. Like Marlene said, what tends to work best for me is when I come up with an idea and can build the idea and then say, this is what I want to talk about. Then, okay, well, what do I want for an ending and what do I want for an opening? The main part, again, is what, what is the body of what you want to discuss with the group? Because you can always change the beginning to the end or the end to the beginning, whichever group you're working with. But it's more fun to put it together sometimes and sometimes you can be just traveling about and come up with ideas working with other people. I read a story last week and discussed it with a friend of mine that brought back some post-traumatic stress memories from being in a gym class years ago. We <laughs> shared, that meeting last, shared that last night. And it turned it into a humorous speech. Very. Although at the time, it was absolutely terrifying to a seventh grader. Things we can look back on and laugh. And there is a lot to the old adage, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. I suppose. So you use life experiences a lot in your presentations. Yes, a lot of times. Okay. Well, when I, when I put a speech together, I tend to do it mostly while I'm busy laying down at night getting ready to go to sleep. And I think about what I want to say. And I have actually fallen asleep putting something together. And, and then in my laying there, I actually imagine how it's being heard. And so... I almost give myself my own feedback. But uh, life experiences is one of the best ways to really uh, get your point across. And when we're talking about writing speeches, they talk about, if, if you have a short time to write a speech, talk about something that you know about. Your natural enthusiasm, your natural passion for it will help carry it over the rough spots if that's the case. But as in Toastmasters, we spend a lot of time writing speeches, practicing speeches, and then honing them out and sharpening them so that the next time we give them at the next level, usually, it becomes a better, 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 and finally a great speech. In fact, that's what Dr. Smedley had in mind when he uh, put Toastmasters together as an organization. Initially, it was an all-men organization, being at the YMCA, I suppose it would be, but uh, in any case, he thought that all these young men who had jobs to go to the next day, perhaps classes where they were going to take tests, maybe even oral exams, 
job interviews, anything of that sort, they talked about it like, oh, I've got to go do this tomorrow. He thought at the time, why don't they put those together in presentations and share them amongst the group here, give them some feedback, and then when they do it for real, it will come out really well. Well, that simple germ of an idea has evolved from 1924 to the present to where we have like over 12,000 clubs worldwide. We help like a quarter of a million people every year become more confident, more efficient, more polished, as it were, in public speaking. And so this time we talked about how to put a speech together and what we, how we did it. Last time we talked about impromptu. We'll have another topic next time. Now, the parliamentary portion of this is a section where we try to give information to each person that they can use uh, to better their business life or their life within another club or another organization. We have two wonderful banners behind us. The gold one on the, let's see, that would be your right side, maybe my left side. Anyway, the gold one is an old Toastmaster banner. It's an antique now, but we like it because it, it just reminds us of where we've come from. It's the Toastmaster emblem. The other one, obviously, with the AIP, is our representative of the American Institute of Parliamentarians. So we've balanced our presentations tonight. We have four presenters. Each one is going to talk about some area of expertise in their particular subject. And the first subject is going to be Toastmasters, and I am very pleased to announce that the man who's going to be giving this speech is the Lieutenant Governor-Elect for Education and Training for all of Indiana and part of Kentucky, and he takes office July 1st. Let's welcome DTM Bob Norris. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and most honored guests at home. Well, there was a heck of a lot of things they didn't tell me when I signed on for this job into district leadership. But I am learning, I am growing, and what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and can even be fun. I currently in the, am in the position of the Lieutenant Governor of Marketing, which is a fancy way of saying that you're supposed to be helping build cl clubs, build membership, and keep people from leaving the group. Now, why would people leave a great organization? Well, sometimes they die. Sometimes they get a different job. Sometimes they believe they've gotten everything out of Toastmasters they can get. And I think the only way you'll ever really get everything out of Toastmasters is when it's time to move from death to the next stage. And then maybe you can organize a club and a parliamentary group there. I don't know. But I think as long as you're alive and breathing, you can do a lot of great things. The Lieutenant Governor of Education and Training is the number two position in the state. And please remember, we're all volunteers, and yes, we're all a little bit crazy. We're crazy about Toastmasters, and that's why we do what we do. Because the reality of it is, is if you had to pay us for what we do, no one could afford us. We give of ourselves, and in the process, we get back from the people. We have a lot of wonderful training that goes on in each district. As an example, in District 11, again, Indiana and Northern Kentucky, we do officer training. Each club has seven officers, and there are roles in making this a good club and a fun club, and one that really helps the members. If you didn't have a procedure for the club, you'd have chaos. Everything would be happening all around you and different, and you would never have a meeting, much less a club, and heaven forbid, you'd never learn anything about why you're there. So what the Lieutenant Governor of Education and Training does is to help to organize the training sessions with the clubs, and twice a year we do something called Toastmasters Leadership Institute, or TLI for short. We like acronyms, and we will have it usually in the central part of the state, and we will invite members from all over the district to attend. It's like a big powwow for all the Toastmasters. We will have officer training for each position of the club, as well as we'll have breakout workshops. For example, we'll have some workshops coming up. One workshop in particular I'm excited about is on social media. Now, my age, well, maybe not so much, but the youngsters coming in, the 20s, and the 30s, and some of the 40s, this is the hot item. How many do you see walking? They're texting, or they're walking with their iPads. 
doing things. Computers are going to go the wayside of the Model T. It will all come down to the small electronic devices that people can carry and use. Another one is called VARC. No, that's not bark like the dog. This is called VARC. This is on different learning modalities all of us have. If I am talking on one modality and somebody's in, over here, they get lost. There isn't an understanding. So we do a lot of things that are fun, and we put them together, and we even have some door prizes. Let's face it, everybody likes stuff for free. I used Where I used to work, we swore that if you put out breadcrumbs or donut crumbs, you would draw a crowd because people love stuff for free. Well, we don't put out donut crumbs. We actually will have some donuts and some good food. You have to balance the unhealthy with the healthy, <clears throat> but we will also have some, some fun with it. Twice a year, we also do something called our conferences. In the fall, we will tend to do the conference in one portion of the state, such as the southern portion of the state, or we'll do it in the northern portion. This year, we're doing it in Evansville, clear to the southwest tip of the state. It's going to be very exciting. We're going to draw a different group of people. I was on a conference call last week, and the people are very excited in that area for doing it. But part of the Lieutenant Governor of Education training does is he helps to draw the people in to do the training at the conference. Because this is not just one big party like going to Las Vegas. We save those for the evenings. But during the afternoon, we will have education and training workshops, which teach you something and also give you the ability to network and meet more Toastmasters. So in the process of doing this, you have double benefits. So that will be a very fun experience coming up the first part of November. We typically, in the fall conference, will have a Friday night fun night, which might be anything from karaoke to mystery theater. Or in one conference, we did a version of Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? where you went up and competed against someone and you picked a title off of a board and it was read to you. And I was not smarter than a fifth grader. Uh, the person that competed against me did very, very well. <clears throat> I think her name was Bernice. Anyway, oh <laughs> we had a lot of fun with it and that's what we like to do because when you learn, it can be boring. If you can combine fun with learning, it becomes an experience that stays with you. So we do the conferences, and those are really a very important part. And another important part of what we do is we step out of that comfort zone. I won't step away because you'll lose me with the camera. But when people become comfortable, they will go into competitions on speaking. We, For instance, this fall, summer fall, we're doing a humorous speech contest. Now, this is not like going to your local nightclub and just giving one-liners. This is where you use humor to make the speech effective and to impart it with the people. And then in the spring, we go back to the international contest. This is where you can end up competing against people from around the world. And the purpose of that speech is to deliver a message. Now, you can use humor, providing it's not just solely a funny speech, but I've also seen those work well. But the underlying concept with any of the speeches should be to deliver some type of message. Is it a life message? Is it an experience like I talked about last night? Or is it something we can all grow? Or maybe everybody in the crowd has shared at one time. Because the way of creating rapport is to share our experiences and to laugh at ourselves. People love it when we laugh at me. They don't like it if I laugh at them necessarily, but that's part of the education and training. How can we make ourselves better? And in the process, all these come together and they help the Toastmasters in our district grow. We oftentimes have Toastmasters from other districts joining us. And when we go to the convention, which happens once a year, and this year we'll be in Cincinnati, we will again have Toastmasters coming from all over the world. I met some of the nicest people from South Africa, from the Middle East, from Asia last year in Florida. They came all the way to our, our convention here. 
Next year, it'll be our turn to travel. The Lieutenant Governor of Education has a lot more than I realized when I signed up for this job. But I think it gives me some challenges, gives me some growth opportunities, and I'm looking forward to diving into the deep end of the pool. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Bob, for those facts, those words of wisdom, and uh, some of the ideas concerning your duties and what you're supposed to be doing and will be doing. <clears throat> I read somewhere that uh, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. So that might be something to keep in mind. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. So that allows for lots and lots of growth. Our next presenter is going to be talking about the parliamentary side of our program, and that's going to be Mr. Tom Haller, who has just recently been elected president of the Parliamentary Society, as well as he is the outgoing president of Anthony Wayne Toastmasters, and he currently serves as Area 24 Governor. Please welcome Tom Haller. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins, fellow Toastmasters and parliamentarians, and especially those of you who are joining us in TV land. We are delighted that you've let us come into your home and have confidence that we will give you some information that will be well worthwhile. And if you would like to call us and talk to us, that is also possible. 422-3902. 422-3902. Give us a call. We'll see if we can answer any of your questions that you might have. Now, I am here for the express purpose of encouraging you to do more with parliamentary procedure. It is an underutilized and very valuable tool. You need, absolutely need, to have this in meetings. Now, I am going to assume that your meetings have agendas. If they don't have agendas, there's nothing we can do for you. There's nothing anyone can do for you. So, by all means, have an agenda. Have you ever been to a meeting that seemed to go on forever and yet nothing was accomplished? There are actually other kinds of meetings, but if you don't have parliamentary procedure, that is what you will almost assuredly end up with. Parliamentary procedure makes it possible <clears throat> for everyone to be heard in an appropriate way and for the majority then to get to make the decision of how things should go. It's a very efficient thing. It absolutely is an essential part of your business lives. The late Bill Cartwright went to some kind of, among many, many other hats that he wore, he was, I think, a town council chairman, something like that. He went to a meeting of these kind of people and one woman said that their meetings lasted for hours and hours and they never got anything done. His meetings last for 45 minutes and they get everything done they're supposed to. The difference was parliamentary procedure and also, I believe, agendas. So, <clears throat> there are so many ways that parliamentary procedure can help you get on with it. If you're around the family supper table and you want to have a discussion, great! It's probably the best thing you could do. But if you want to get business accomplished, then you absolutely have to put things in the form of a motion. You do that by saying, I move that we. Now, somebody may be all for this thing that he's going to suggest, but he may be the only one there that has any interest. You do not need to listen to him or her bloviate for several hours on the topic. If he makes the motion, it should be then seconded if there is any interest. If there is a resounding silence and no one says anything, that is a hint that nobody wants to talk about it. And the presiding officer should just say, for lack of a second, the motion dies, next item of business. And that should take care of it, at least till the next meeting. Now, if people immediately jump up and start arguing with him, that's an implied motion. Even if nobody agrees with him, You've blown your chance to just go on with things because you've shown there was enough interest in it to discuss it. Another very useful thing that you could do 
<clears throat> to keep the meeting moving if your agenda has time listed on it. Usually a Toastmaster Club agenda will not. I have seen them where they do, but typically they won't. When you get a little higher up at what we call deck meetings or TLIs like Bob mentioned, there will be times posted. Now if it gets to be 10 o'clock and they're still working on what should have been over at 9.05, you as a member, because mind you the agenda has been approved at the beginning, that basically means you have a right to at 10 o'clock be discussing the 10 o'clock things. So you as a member can stand up <coughs> and say point of order. Orders of the day. Orders of the day, thank you. Orders of the day. The agenda is the orders of the day. That will force the presiding officer to either say, okay, we're going to have to stop this conversation, skip everything that we should have done, and go to the 10 o'clock thing, or he can put it to a vote. It'll take a two-thirds vote to make an exception to this because you, the members, have been promised that you'll be doing 10 o'clock things at 10 o'clock. So that can greatly move things along. <coughs> One time, this has been many years ago, long before I was a parliamentarian, I was at a meeting. My sole purpose for being there was to take a little girl to dance for them. Many, many of us were there for that express purpose. They, many small children put on dances. When they got to the business meeting, there apparently was no parliamentarian there. They had dueling motions that were incompatible with each other. You couldn't have them both exist at the same time. And they went round and round. Finally, it occurred to somebody that there were many innocents, such as myself and the little girl I had with me, and they permitted us to leave long after this meeting should have been over. As far as I know, they may still be there doing their thing. <laughs> no reason to think it ever stopped. All this comes from a lack of parliamentary knowledge. Now, since you, the listeners, are obviously the elite, the elite of the Fort Wayne area, since you're listening to such a high-class program, I'm going to put it upon your shoulders to go out and find out about parliamentary procedure, if you don't know about it, and carry the message. There are several ways this can happen. We have a club that meets right here at the library every third Monday. We meet in the Globe Room. Guests are welcome. Many of us go out and will educate you, generally for free, to, you know, for your organization or group of organizations to be better parliamentarians. Uh, Mr. Wilkins in particular sometimes has what my son the musician would call a paid gig, where he will be parliamentarian for some group. You can also be self-educated by getting Robert's Rules of Order. Now, there are other parliamentary organizations and theories other than Roberts, but it's the most common. You could also get a book along the order of Parliamentary Rules for Dummies. Hate the title, love the book. You get a lot of education very quickly in that. It can help you a great deal. But when you go to your gardening clubs, when you go to your association meetings, I've been to a few association meetings that could have desperately desperately used a little parliamentary procedure. Tell these people, tell the leaders to get their parliamentary minds in order. Most parliamentary things are common sense, but you have to have a certain knowledge of the parliamentary procedures before it makes common sense to you. Otherwise, you're a caveman trying to make common sense of mathematics. You need a certain basis then it is generally fairly straightforward. You absolutely need to have parliamentary procedure if you are going to be efficient in your meetings. You need to be very careful that you don't violate your bylaws. You can make some very serious problems for yourself if you ignore the bylaws that your organization has. You can also make some serious problems if your organization doesn't have bylaws. If you don't have any, you need to get yourself some of those. But if you violate the bylaws, say there are not enough of you there to form a quorum. And see, I imagine many people within the sound of my voice have no idea what a quorum is. 
but you need a certain percentage, a certain part of your total organization there before you can make changes. You absolutely have to do this because if you go ahead and make a change and there's not enough of you there for it to be legal, believe me, the legal ramifications can be very serious. People do not like to have their rights trampled on and people who have no idea what's going on wouldn't go to a meeting if you paid them. All of a sudden, they're deeply offended and hiring lawyers. And trust me, most nonprofit organizations, which is what we generally deal with, do not have enough money to hire a lawyer. So it pretty much ends the organization as we know it. So I urge you, urge you, find out about parliamentary procedure, go forward, spread the word. That's a wonderful, highly effective tool. Mr. Wilkins. Thank you very much, Tom. Good words and words of wisdom that we could all use. We're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we will continue with two more presentations this evening. So we'll go to that break now. Thank you very much. And now for our next speaker, Stanley Lichner. <laughs> Speaking in public doesn't have to be a death sentence. At Toastmasters, we can help you overcome your fears. I'd like to begin uh, tonight with a uh, little joke. Uh, this guy, he's a farmer. He says, hey, hello, I'm sorry. But see, seriously, folks. Um, uh, Speaking in public is no joke. Doc farmer says, a uh, doctor says, f chicken says. For help, call Toastmasters, the public speaking support group. <laughs> the chicken. All the education in the world won't help you get ahead in life if you can't express your ideas effectively. Every day, competition for advancement gets tougher and tougher. You need an edge. A Toastmasters club can give you that edge. A low-cost learning experience for men and women, Toastmasters gives you the confidence to express your ideas to anyone. Get the Toastmasters edge. What future do you envision for yourself? What dreams do you have? If you want your dreams to come true, you must have confidence in yourself and your abilities. A Toastmasters club can help you build that confidence. A low-cost learning experience for men and women. Toastmasters shows you how to express yourself clearly and effectively. Make your dreams a reality. Join a Toastmasters club. Okay, welcome back. A little bit of a break there is good for you as well as it's good for us. We've heard two presentations tonight, and we're mixing things up, so we're doing the parliamentary and the Toastmaster all together. The common denominator is that there are all these presentations by our very experienced members. Now, the next person that's going to speak is a dynamo. She truly, truly is. Since she's been here, she has served as conference chair for District 11 twice for all conferences. She has served two years as a division B governor. Uh, she is a past District, 8, District 28 uh, governor and an all-around really nice lady, and I believe she currently serves as the education vice president of the Bob Lyman Toastmaster Club. With her presentation on motion, emotion, please welcome Marlene Perry. Thank you, Dave. Motions. And Tom alluded to it a little bit earlier about the steps for making a motion. And that is probably one of the biggest part of the business of a meeting. And there are actually a number of steps to a motion. Anytime you want to accomplish anything in a meeting, you have to have a motion to get it on the floor so it can be discussed. And how do you approach that? 
how would you approach it out there in TV land? If you don't know, listen up. First of all, a person wanting to make a motion has to be recognized by the chair. So they either raise their hand or they stand up or some way get the attention of the meeting chair, at which point the chair will then recognize that member. The member then states the motion. I move, and you remember he said, I move it. You don't say, I make a motion or I motion that. I move that we have pizza after our meeting this evening. Another member then will, they don't have to be recognized. They could actually just say, I second the motion. Or if people want to start discussing it right away, that is considered an automatic session, second. But usually someone will stand up and say, or actually just speak out and say, I second the motion. That means at least two people are interested in that particular motion. Two people are hungry for pizza, I guess. <laughs> the chair states the question on the motion. It is moved and seconded that we have pizza after our TV show this evening. At that point, the motion now belongs to the group. And somebody can't later say, well, I withdraw my motion. Well, it doesn't belong to them anymore. It now belongs to the group. At that point, the members just debate the motion. And then eventually when the debate starts running out, the chair will ask for a vote on the motion. And they'll ask it in this manner. You don't say, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed, same sign. No. Because when they announce the what one, the ayes have it. Well, because everybody voted aye, because you didn't, you said same sign. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. That way there's clear delineation of what you're voting for. Once the vote has taken place, then the chair will announce the results and what the action will be. In this case, they vote. All those in favor say aye. Oh, the motion on the floor is that we have pizza after our TV show tonight. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion carries, and we will have pizza after the TV show this evening. That's a little bit how a motion is handled. However, sometimes people want to get a little more elaborate and amend the motion. You can have up to two amendments to a main motion, not anymore. And when you're dealing with amendments, okay, Bob, are you ready here? I'm ready. Okay. You have the motion, and then somebody comes along and wants to amend it. Uh, maybe they want to have a particular kind of pizza, whatever, but they, there's a first amendment on the floor. So the first amendment is built upon the main motion. Amendment 1. And then, a little bit later, somebody wants to amend the amendment. You're allowed to. And so that way, the amendment... Now, we have two amendments and the main motion. What would happen if somebody would try to vote on the main motion without having the amendments dealt with? What happens? Exactly. So you stack them back up again. You have to have deal with the motions and the amendments in order, actually in reverse order. Uh, last in, first out. So if you have two amendments, amendment number two you have to deal with first. Once that's taken care of, now you have an amended amendment. So you'll deal with amendment number one that has been amended, and now you can finally deal with the main motion. That is how you deal with motions in order. There are several other types of ranking motions. There's a whole series of non-ranking motions, but we're not going to deal with those tonight. We're just going to deal with the ranking ones, the privileged motions and the subsidiary motions. Let's go with the subsidiary motions first. And the interesting part of a subsidiary motion is that in order, it, they are ranked in order, and if you need to know what the order is, you can consult with Robert's Rules of Order, or there are a number of different documents that will help you with this. But the order of the subsidiary motions, 
The top one is to lay on the table. We're not going to go with that yet. The second one is previous question, and that's calling for a vote. The third one is limit or extend the limits of debate. The next one is postpone to a certain time or a definite time. Next one, commit or refer to a committee. Amend and finally postpone indefinitely. Now since postpone indefinitely is down on the totem pole, if somebody moves to limit or extend debate, that takes precedence over anything below it. So if they say that we want to cease the debate, then it would pretty much stop and nothing else happens at that point. Most of these motions, in fact, every one of these motions does take a second. So somebody can't just come up with this and then it happens. They all have to have seconds. Many of them require debate. Not all of them. Lay, uh, to lay on the table, previous question or limit or extend limits of debate do not take call for discussion. The others are discussed before they're voted on. And part of them will actually take a two-thirds vote. That means that you cannot just have a straight majority. A majority would be half of the group plus one, and two-thirds is, that means twice as many people have to vote in favor of it as against it. So that would, and I might add, in a vote at a meeting, you can abstain. And it doesn't count as a negative vote. It doesn't count as a positive vote. It just doesn't count, period. So that's, and many of these also can be reconsidered. So if somebody would move to commit or refer to a committee, you can't go back and amend it at that point because that either has to be voted up, debated, and then voted up or down before anything else can happen. So those are the subsidiary motions. Then we have the privileged motions. Now those don't actually refer to a motion on the floor, a main motion, but these are other things that happen in the meeting. And the order of those would be fix the time at which to adjourn, a motion to adjourn, a motion to recess, and then there are two others that are a little bit different. Those first three that I mentioned do require a second and then they're voted upon. There are two others. One is raise a question of privilege and the final one is call for the orders of the day. And I think Tom mentioned that in his presentation. What are we talking about when we mention questions of privilege? And by the way, neither one of these you have to get, you don't have to, you can interrupt a speaker, you can interrupt a speaker for these, and they are not voted upon, the chair decides how to deal with them. But to raise a question of privilege, and that is to call something to the attention about the meeting itself, not about the motion, but about the meeting itself, such as, Mr. Chair, I believe the room's too hot, can we do something to change it? That kind of thing and call for the orders of the day, say we're not going in order and somebody's upset about it and says, wait a minute, we need to get back on track so they can call for the orders of the day or they can actually go to move to the part of the meeting where they should be. So these are the privileged motions and the subsidiary motions. I hope to be back at another time and talk about the non-ranking motions. So, and you can become familiar with these. I am referring to basic parliamentary information from one of the national parliamentary organizations and they put it in really concise form and very easy to understand. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Marlene. Those little blocks are very helpful in, in describing and explaining exactly what you're doing. It's an issue that can be kind of confusing, but once you learn to work with it a little bit, it begins making all kinds of sense. We have one final presentation tonight, and we always save the best for last, as you know. And this young lady that's going to come up here and speak to us is the Division B Lieutenant Governor. She's serving her second term, starting on July 1st as Division Governor. 
under her responsibility or tutelage are three different area governors and all of the clubs in the Fort Wayne area. So with her visions for Division B, let's welcome our own Patricia Kanabi, DTM. Thank you, Master Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and most importantly, our guests at home. When Dave contacted me and asked me to be on the show this evening and told me he wanted me to talk about the mission and my vision for Division B for this coming year, I decided how could I best put this information forth that might make it a little bit interesting and a little compelling for those Toastmasters who are listening at home. I know the Toastmasters here are very attentive and, and very compelled to hear what I have to say, although maybe some of you at home have run off to the kitchen to grab a snack. I thought possibly the best way for me to broach the subject of my mission for Division B for the 2013-2014 year is to look at it as Christmas in July. What would I do if Santa Claus came to me and said, here, Patricia, I will give you anything you want for Christmas. And it starts in July, because that's when the Toastmaster year begins. Here is my wish list, Santa, I would say. And it's a long one. If I were Bob Norris, I would be rolling out a scroll, and it would be running across the floor. <laughs> Nevertheless, it is a long list. I would like all the clubs in Division B to have at least 20 members on their club roster. That would give each club the opportunity to be a healthy club. That would give each club the opportunity to have officers in attendance at each meeting. That would give each person an opportunity to share in the roles that take place at a Toastmasters meeting. Then I would say to Santa, may all members of every club bring their leadership manuals to each meeting and get, get credit for roles that they fill. This is an area where we have a challenge in every single club. Many times members of clubs will walk in and an officer will say, did you bring your manual? I will evaluate you on the role you're taking tonight. No, I left my manual at home and some pile in the office on my desk, I think. Bringing manuals to the meeting, very important. My third wish, right along with that second wish, may all members bring their communication manuals to each meeting and give each speech as a manual speech. Very important to get credit so those awards are earned and each person that is part of a club is an integral member in moving that club through the Distinguished Club program to meet Distinguished Club status. That brings me to my, ne my next wish. May all clubs in Division B earn the Distinguished Club status. I would love to see all areas in Division B grow by one to two clubs to sustain the area and the division. I would like to see all clubs train all seven officers twice a year. I would like to see club members be interested in leadership roles beyond the club and volunteer for area division and district leadership roles. But Santa, this list is long and I know that your time is short here this evening. Here are my realistic goals for Division B. I would like to see the division as a group, as three areas, grow by two to three clubs. I want to identify the club members who want to grow beyond the club level and assist in leadership positions in, at the district level. I want more participation on the marketing team from club members, and I want more participation so that we can accomplish more as a marketing team for the clubs in our division. I would like to see all of our clubs in the division work on the club success plan and strive to achieve distinguished club status. And lastly, I want Division B to be a distinguished division this coming year. That means that we don't lose one club and we have 40% or 6 to 7 of our clubs distinguished. That, Santa, is my mission for the year. I know my wish list was long. I did shorten it to a more realistic set of visions and missions for the year. And 
Santa, thank you for bringing me Christmas in July. I would like to return control of our meeting to Mr. Dave Wilkins. Thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, actually, good goals, good visions from each and every one of you this evening, and I just think that we can accomplish those things, and we probably will in all probability. Um, do you have any record of how many clubs are going to be distinguished this year in Division B? Three to four look like they will four? be distinguished. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're working on our Anthony Wayne, hoping to be a presidential distinguished. Oh, we will be. You will be. <laughs> you you will. will be. There you I, go. I hope nobody has to be hurt, but we will be. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, you didn't call in this evening to talk to us. And if you, we still have a few moments. If you'd like to call, that number is 422-3902. We would take your questions at this time. We have operators standing by. And in the meantime, since we have just a few minutes left, I always like to give our guests a, uh, a parting shot or a chance to have a final thought or moment. And so can we start with you, Marlene? Do you have a final thought that you'd like to share with us? Well, I just want to remind you viewers out there that we are available to do workshops on parliamentary procedure. We actually we enjoy doing it. It's really a lot of fun. But we also do workshops on public speaking and maybe people as a result, I did one this afternoon, and maybe as a result of one of our workshops, People might be more interested in joining with our parliamentary, our AIP, American Institute of Parliamentarians group, or joining one of the Fort Wayne area Toastmasters groups. Okay, well, thank you, Marlene. I know that uh, parliamentary procedure actually, as an activity, rates somewhere between an IRS audit and, and or say a, a root canal. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you, you've heard that before, haven't you? Oh, I think so. Oh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay. Uh, Bob Norris, what would your final comments want to be this evening? Well, my, my final comments, Dave, would be that everyone can benefit from belonging to or attending Toastmaster meeting and even, I will say this in earnest, going through the parliamentary procedure part. When I first heard about parliamentary procedure, I thought this is going to be as much fun as being drugged through a cactus patch. <laughs> it, a lot more fun than that. I'm not in it, in it as much as these folks, but they make it fun, they make it challenging, and they make it to learn. Likewise, for those of you that may have been involved with any public speaking in the past, you may have thought, uh-oh, another cactus patch with road bumps. Yeah, yeah. Toastmasters helps to evaluate, to motivate. We build you up so you want to get out, so you want to participate, and you you learn, earn one item you can never buy, and that's confidence. That's one of the things that you really and truly do learn with Toastmasters. And Bob, I do have your application for AIP in my briefcase. I'd be happy to share that with I'm you. I'm sure you would be. And, uh, I know you would just love the group. You probably know everybody in it. I suspect it's possible. I think you. I think you actually do. Okay. And on this side of the room, let's talk to Tom Haller for just a few moments. And Tom, what do you have as a parting remark for us this evening? Well, I would echo the sentiments that have been stated so far. Yeah, you know, I know that probably it seems like another meeting is the last thing you need in your life, but trust me, whether it's AIP. Toastmaster meeting, there's probably nothing that you could do which would give you greater value for the time spent. And just to be clear about Dave's comments relative to root canal and so forth, we do have a lot of fun at the AI <laughs> meetings. We have a lot of fun. We would not have it any other way. Whether it's Toastmasters or AIP, we never criticize. Criticism is of no value. It doesn't help anybody. We evaluate to motivate, and that's all we do. We're there for you and each other. Oh, thank you, Tom. That is a very true statement. <clears throat> Toastmasters is the one organization I know of that dedicates all of their members to your personal growth once you become a member. When you're a presenter, all eyes are on you. When you're a presenter, you're going to receive a fair and efficient evaluation you're going to learn and grow by leaps and bounds, depending on just how much you put into it. Okay. 
Uh, Patricia, your final thoughts for the evening? My final thoughts for the evening include, if I were to quote anyone, I would quote Dave Wilkins' fine wife, Bernice Wilkins, and she says, and I quote, get thee to a Toastmasters meeting, end quote. To help you in the listening audience, watching audience, to do that, I would like to invite you to the American Red Cross Open House Toastmasters meeting, which is taking place on June 11th at noon at the American Red Cross building on California Road at the corner of Coliseum and Parnell. We are offering food. You will get to see new members being inducted into the club. You will see some members being awarded different levels that they have earned by way of their leadership and their speeches that they have given and you will see a very small sample of how a meeting is run please join us on june 11th at noon at the american red cross for an open house thank you okay well thank you patricia for those inspiring words and i hope you get a great attendance thank you. <clears throat> one of our former presidents of toastmasters international was a lady named helen blanchard and she said if you get everything there is to get out of Toastmasters, you will never get out of Toastmasters. So it just makes perfect sense. Our next live TV show will be on July 2nd. We'll be right here in the library, once again, talking about our favorite topics. I want to thank our old friend Dennis Osborne for being back tonight and helping us out with cue cards and uh, camera work. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, Mr. Bob Hunter is on the other camera. Thank you very much, Bob. And the lovely Patty Hunter is in the sound booth, making sure that we sound good on the air. And, of course, we couldn't be here if we didn't have a director named Elizabeth Lord who gets us on the air. If you want to do a TV show like we're doing, there's absolutely no charge. If you're an Allen County resident, come down here and talk to the staff at Access Fort Wayne, and they will put you on the track to being a host of your own TV show. We have one minute left, and I would just like to echo what these folks have all said this evening, that you can't help but grow, either in knowledge of parliamentary procedure or in knowledge of effective communication, uh, without using the Toastmaster organization. <clears throat> there are a lot of other places you could take speech courses, uh, the ones that give you the pass-fail grades. Uh, there are some seminars that are very costly, but nonetheless, we are a very uh, value-minded, and you get much, much, much for the few shekels that it costs to join Toastmasters. So until next time, may all your meetings be fair and efficient, and until then, God bless, and bye-bye.